we need to go back and think for a minute about what biofilms do. It's not just a matter of walling off the infection or embedding the infection, but they make treatment much, much more difficult. Um, there's about um, five things that I, I think I should list here. First of all, the antibiotics can't get through the biofilm to the bacteria very well. Um, partial partially partial penetration is what I should say of the antibiotic means that the bacteria only see a th sub therapeutic dose of the antibiotic. They don't get enough antibiotic to eradicate the infection, but they do get enough. It's sort of like giving a vaccination in which they, they now recognize that class of antibiotics and they can develop resistance genes. So when you start having multi-drug resistant bacteria, that's a, a big red flag that you're dealing with a biofilm. If you suffer from chronic urinary tract infections, also known as UTIs, or a condition called interstitial cystitis, you know how difficult it can be to deal with these symptoms of bladder pain and discomfort. While diet supplements and medications are often used, Few are aware of the important connection between biofilms and interstitial cystitis. Today we are talking with Ruth Chris all about biofilms and why you should know about them. Ruth Chris is an amazing nurse practitioner who specializes in treating chronic urinary tract infections and interstitial cystitis. Her interest in biofilms, genetics, and mycotoxins developed through a discovery of an association between these factors and chronic urinary tract infections and interstitial cystitis. I am Dr. Andrew Wong, co-founder of Capital Integrative Health. This is a podcast that is dedicated to transforming the consciousness around what it means to be healthy and understanding the root causes of both disease and wellness. I will also say that this conversation was really mind-blowing because biofilms can actually affect many other conditions, including chronic infections, chronic fatigue, etc. So really a amazing conversation to delve into today. Hope you enjoy it. All right. Well, welcome Ruth Chris of the podcast. Thank you so much for being on today. It's my delight to be here and to uh, share with you some of the things that I've learned about chronic infections and how biofilms relate to that. So we are going to be talking about the wonderful world of biofilms and immune health and how they can really impact people's health, how we can uh, overcome, you know, biofilm related chronic illness today with Ruth, who's a expert in this area. But first, Ruth, let's kind of go a bit more personal and talk about what kind of got you interested in biofilms and, and chronic infections in the first place. Certainly. Um... I, I need to back up just a little bit, and um, because you're based in Maryland, I'll say that I was born and raised in Western Maryland. Um, I had the privilege of working in a pediatrician's office in high school and did a project in a microbiology lab from biology in 10th grade, and um, really got introduced to this whole area of, of medicine and how exciting it was to discover the relationships in the world between um, the, the way the microbes worked and the way people worked and how that contributed to their health. Um, I have a pretty extensive public health background and was fortunate enough when I was at Washington County Health Department um, to have my office right below the Johns Hopkins Research Center, um, which was in Hagerstown, Maryland. And um, the director of that was Dr. George Comstock, who was the world's leading authority on tuberculosis. And he was their advisor on the World Health Organization. Um, we got a pretty good education uh, about tuberculosis. And I discovered that this could be a chronic infection that required long-term treatment. And that was a different model than I think most doctors 
or or any healthcare provider um, is exposed to. Most of the exposure is for acute illness in which you give a short course of antibiotics and the person recovers. And yet here was a situation where someone, well, not someone, but a whole population had an infection that was chronic and did require long-term treatment. Um, this sort of set the stage for me when I had repeated urinary tract infections and eventually, I think it took me about, oh gosh, at least seven or eight doctors in four or five years to get an interstitial cystitis diagnosis. Um, and at that point I was too sick to work. Um, it was debilitating. Um, I chronically felt like I had a urinary tract infection, but I was being told that the cultures were negative and that therefore I had interstitial cystitis, which was considered um, chronic, degenerative, and uncurable. And during that time, a bunch of us before the years of internet were communicating by phone and letter and um, I learned about a PhD microbiologist, Paul Fugazzato, who was using broth cultures instead of the standard urine auger plates, culture plates, and was finding infection. And so I sent my urine off to him, and lo and behold, it came back with a bunch of nasty bacteria that he treated. And although it took two years of sending him specimens on a monthly basis, um, we went after infection, after infection, after infection, and I recovered and have been quite healthy with that for over 30 years now. Um, so that gave me a, a heart and a compassion for people who struggle and are just basically told with these chronic infections, well, it's just something you have to learn to live with it, or they end up on the doctor's doorstep every month or two with an, another supposedly new urinary tract infection. And um, they're just caught in this vicious cycle and don't have a way out. Mm, that's really a powerful story. So just curious when you're treating your own interstitial cystitis, which sounds like turned out to be a chronic bladder infection, were you treating with, with antibiotics or herbals or were you treating with biofilm treatments as well? Oh, this was long before the discovery yeah. of biofilms. Um, we're talking the 1980s, the dark ages here. The dark ages, okay. Um, <laughs> it turns out that, that long-term antibiotics do chip away at biofilms. Um, that's still the mechanism that people depend on to teach, to treat tuberculosis, chronic prostatitis, and a lot of other infections. But um, there are more efficient ways of learning what's causing the biofilm. And then once you have that piece of information, then you know the best way to break it down so you don't end up having to do antibiotics long term like I did. So let's talk about biofilms and, and how they impact human health. But first of all, just talk real basic about what biofilms are. Why are they so important? Certainly. Um, I think when most people think about biofilms, they think of an ooey gooey slime. <laughs> and that is somewhat of a misnomer that it was even named film <laughs> because that conjures in our head that that image of something that's that's a slime covering. Um, that might be true in the GI tract. Um, certainly in the dental world, there's a there's a slimy covering on the teeth that accumulates um, like overnight while you brush your teeth. Um, and we know that that slime does harbor bacteria. The dentists are sort of ahead of the rest of the medical community in appreciating the importance um, of, of addressing that. Um, because the funding has been mostly with the oil industry, most of the of the research comes out of the Biofilm Research Center in Montana, in which the microbiologists there are studying 
petroleum degrading bacteria in the oil pipes. <laughs> and those petroleum degrading bacteria are in biofilms and that probably is more of a slime. Um, but let's talk about the other types that we have that I think are more relevant to people and the medical community. Um, first of all, bacteria can make their own biofilms and that's what most microbiologists are able to look at and study in their labs. And that's what the oil industry is mainly looking at. Um, this type of biofilm is it's called an extracellular DNA biofilm, and some pathogens do a better job of doing that than others. And that also explains why some infections like um, tuberculosis, H. pylori that causes stomach ulcers, Pseudomonas and Klebsiella can be more difficult to treat than other infections. And just to make it a little more complicated, this extracellular DNA biofilm can also produce amyloid fibers. And amyloid is what we sort of associate with the brain and Alzheimer's. But this extracellular DNA produces amyloid fibers that act like hooks that attach the bacteria to a surface. So that's certainly different than an ooey gooey slime that we envision. Um, the second main way in which people get biofilms is that the body itself is capable of producing something called a fibrin biofilm. And I sort of think of fibrin as that spider web material to which blood cells attach to form a blood clot. And that's what happens if you have an acute injury, you cut yourself, the, the body produces a lot of fibrin, the red blood cells attach to it, and you get a nice little clot and then a scab. But if the process is, is acute, um, or, I mean, not acute, but it's slow, that gets triggered by um, infection, there isn't clotting, but you get fibrin that ends up depositing either in this biofilm structure or in the arteries is atherosclerotic plaque. And this is a much slower ongoing process. Um, this bacteria, this fibrin, I should say, is not cooked spaghetti um, like you see in some of the diagrams, it's more like uncooked rigid spaghetti that gives it a three-dimensional structure. And I do have pictures of these biofilm pods in the bladder that are three-dimensional. And that's what makes this type of biofilm different than the others. And this is what makes the bio, being able to break down that fibrin is essential if you're gonna, if you're gonna disrupt that type of biofilm. And you, you said there's a couple of other biofilm uh, types as well, or you said there's extracellular DNA, fibrin, amyloid biofilms. Do they, do, does amyloid biofilms contribute to Alzheimer's? Yes. Um, Alan McDonald, who's a pathologist, has spoken many a time at some conferences that I've attended. And um, he talks about finding Lyme in his autopsies um, of Alzheimer's patients. And so we don't know the exact mechanism, but it is suggestive that perhaps that amyloid's deposited in a, an attempt to wall off the Lyme in the brain. What kind of Lyme, uh, what kind of biofilms rather do, do Lyme organisms, uh, the Borrelia, uh, et cetera? Yeah, maybe. that's a great question. Um, I actually have pictures <laughs> of fibrin biofilms in the bloodstream trying to wall off um, the Lyme. And what's really fascinating to me is because Lyme can go into different forms, there's a spirochete, the cell wall deficient, and the cyst form. Um, one of the pictures that I have shows all three forms of Lyme 
from a blood smear in a fibrin matrix. So, so I think that primarily right. we're talking about fibrin biofilms with Lyme patients. Yeah, so it sounds like the function from the body's perspective, trying to protect these organisms from spreading is to try to wall them off with the biofilm, is that? I think that's exactly what's going on. Um, you know, we have different pieces of the immune system and I think that this is one of the body's defenses. Um, it certainly, we see that with, with tuberculosis patients um, that I mentioned earlier and working with Dr. Comstock was that it walls off in the, in the lung, it goes into a spore form, it can lie dormant for years and then reactivate when the immune system goes down, it can spread to other places in the body after a long period of time. Um, so, so that model, I think, applies to some of these other chronic infections as well, because that's how the body works. And I, I, I want to bring the other piece into this, that it's not just a matter of, oh, my body made fibrin and therefore I have biofilms. There's a balance between this coagulation pathway in which the fibrin is generated and the fibrinolytic pathway in which the extra fibrin gets broken down. And this is where most people differ genetically. Um, I mentioned working at the health department in Washington County, Maryland, and one of my jobs there was genetics counseling. Um, we did kind of a little bit of everything, but I was the de designated genetics counselor back when our knowledge of the genetics was in its infancy. And they sent me off to a course and I learned a lot. And that actually gave me a very good foundation for looking at the genetics of people who have these chronic infections. Why is it that most people get a urinary tract infection? They take a short course of antibiotics and in three to five days, they're better and they get on with their lives. But there's a subset that do the same thing and they're still struggling with the urinary issues weeks, months, sometimes years later because these infections have become chronic. What makes that group of people different than other people. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll elaborate on that or do you want do you have another question? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think I think just um, it, it sounds like biofilms are really uh, causative of this persistent uh, symptoms of, of I think your experience and a lot of thousands of other people, probably millions of other people, recurrent urinary tract infections, interstitial cystitis. Let's get into that. I know that's one of your specialties. Um, uh, just to kind of reiterate, I think for people, for listeners here, why are biofilms important in the treatment of recurrent urinary tract infections and interstitial cystitis? Well, let me back up just a little bit here, because I think we, we need to go back and think for a minute about what biofilms do it's not just a matter of walling off the infection or embedding the infection, but they make treatment much, much more difficult. Um, there's about um, five things that I, I think I should list here. First of all, the antibiotics can't get through the biofilm to the bacteria very well. Um, partial partially, partial penetration is what I should say, of the antibiotic means that the bacteria only see a th subtherapeutic dose of the antibiotic. They don't get enough antibiotic to eradicate the infection, but they do get enough. It's sort of like giving a vaccination in which they they now recognize that class of antibiotics and they can develop resistance genes. So when you start having multi-drug resistant bacteria, that's a, a big red flag that you're dealing with a biofilm. Um, the second thing is that 
these drug resistance properties get communicated to other bacteria within the matrix. So quorum sensing is used for bug A to educate bugs B, C, D, and E that we're now smart, we are resistant to this class of drugs. Um, the next way in which the biofilm protects the bacteria is that they actually develop pumps that pump the antibiotic out of this biofilm, um, sort of like a bilge pump on a ship. <laughs> um, they have a certain pH within the biofilm and are therefore able to inactivate some of the antibiotics. Um, and then the last thing I think is an important point that, that is not well appreciated, that if you continuously give antibiotics, you are, you are able to drive the bacteria into a cell wall deficient state. Um, we see this in Lyme that the doxycycline will drive the back the spirochete into a cell wall deficient or L form of the Lyme. Well, the same thing happens with other bacteria. There are certain drugs that if you give over a long, prolonged period of time, will drive these bacteria into a cell wall deficient state. And these cell wall deficient bacteria, first of all, don't grow on a culture plate, which explains why many IC patients have negative cultures on the plate, but, but also it can drive it into a stable form and those stable forms are metabolically dormant. They aren't growing anymore. And antibiotics can only work on growing bacteria. So um, I know that there are some providers who recommend, um, you know, they look at a lab report, they see what bacteria you have, they hand the patient a prescription for the next year of their life and say, we're putting you in this antibiotic for the next year. Well, I don't think that's a good idea because I think that is producing stable cell wall deficient bacteria or persister cells. And then you really are in trouble because you can't kill these bacteria anymore. The, the the bacteria play possum essentially, and they play dead essentially. They kind of become metabolically inactive, and then the immune system just doesn't recognize them. Is that exactly? Kind of and these biofilms will protect them. Um, they give them a happy home. So it's so, a possum with the force field essentially, basically. Yeah, it, and, it it's a it's a major it's a major problem, and I think that. Um, we have to be very careful and judicious in the way in which antibiotics are prescribed. Um, we also know that different bacteria will come out of the biofilm at different times. So if, if I have somebody that has three or four pathogens um, and I treat them, and then the next time when they are tested, they have two or three different ones, it's easy to assume that that's a new infection, but the reality is that the chronic or the recurrent UTI person generally has lots of different bacteria within the biofilm and different ones come out at different times. And so it's not a brand new acute infection. It's actually the same old infection with different pieces of it breaking off and becoming free floating in the urine. So it's kind of like a museum with a rotating art gallery pieces, <laughs> not to try to say museums are biofilms at all. I know they're very clean. <laughs> no, that's a great analogy because, um, you know, I've heard it called an apartment building, a zoo. I mean, take your your analogy anywhere you want to go with it. But the reality is that when you see on a lab report more than two pathogens, you're dealing with a biofilm. And unfortunately, the standard microbiology labs, if they see more than two pathogens, they will throw it away and report it as contaminated. 
you treated thousands of patients with chronic interstitial cystitis. So one of the big take comes that I'm getting here is that, and hopefully listeners are, are as well, is that IC is really mostly chronic bacterial infection with biofilm o- over top of that. How long does it take most people in your uh, wide ranging experience here to treat, you know, successfully treat IC and chronic urinary tract infections? Oh, it's so individual. I mean, if there's a person who started having urinary issues six months earlier, um, if they haven't had a, a prior history of recurrent UTIs, um, it, it, it may only take a few months to clear up completely. Um, using advanced diagnostics with molecular or DNA testing, knowing what their genetics are, and going after the biofilms appropriately. If somebody has some genetic issues that make it difficult for them to break down the biofilms, and this has been going on for years, um, I would say it could take up to two years. They didn't get here overnight. We're not going to fix it overnight. So that's a really key point because chronic infections, you can't just go after the bacteria you have to go after the biofilm as well. And sometimes, like you said, some people are genetically set up to not break down the biofilms as easily. So they need a little bit of assistance there to accelerate that. Yeah. And we should, we should go back to that, that piece. Um, When your body in response to infection starts making extra fibrin, the response should be that there are certain things in the fibrinolytic system that break down the extra fibrin. There's a balance here. Fibrinolytic means lysis, breaking down the fibrin. Exactly, exactly. And so the main pieces in the fibrinolytic system are that your body needs to convert something called plasminogen to plasmin. And plasmin is sort of like a good Pac-Man that goes around and gobbles up, digests the extra fibrin. And in order to do that, there are several pieces. One is TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. And TPA is that clot buster that they use in the emergency room for people coming in with heart attacks and strokes. And that's something your body manufactures. Um, The other piece is something called thrombin-antithrombin complexes. And both of those, and there's some other players as well, but those are the the major ones. Those are the ones that should be upregulating or producing more of themselves to go into battle to break down the extra fibrin. If you have certain genetics your body doesn't do as good a job making thrombin antithrombin complexes, or you bind up or downregulate TPA so that you can't convert plasminogen to plasmin as well as everybody else. Now, those particular genetic um, variations or mutations are found in about 20% of the general population. Uh, Probably their ancestors were in battle, they got wounded, and because they clotted off better and faster than the guy bleeding out next to them, they recovered and went home and had your (laughs) great-great-great-grandparents, and that's why you're here today. So there is a genetic advantage to having one of these mutations if you plan on going out into battle and being potentially wounded. Braveheart, if you're, right. Braveheart. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if, <laughs> if if you aren't one of those people, however, um, it does have the downside. And the downside is that you do not break down fibrin as well as other people. And if you don't break down fibrin as well as other people, if you get an infection, and we're talking about prostatitis or UTIs or sinus infections or ear infections in kids or Lyme or a wound. I mean, any any type of infection that you get, if you're not breaking down the fibrin, you're going to get 
more extensive biofilms and you are more likely for your infection to become chronic than other people. So that's the flip side of this. Now, interestingly, the people who do the best job of making the biofilms are often less symptomatic than the people who do a good job of breaking down the biofilms. So using your symptoms of having a urinary tract infection as a guideline for when you get tested or when you get treated is a little deceptive. <laughs> well, it's a um, silent killer, right? It's a silent, it's sort of meaning the body's walling off these infections. So that's why people are not symptomatic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's sort of like, um, so when I hear the guideline from the American Urological Association, oh, you don't have to treat a high load of bacteria in the urine if the person isn't symptomatic. Um, that's sort of like saying we don't have to treat your high blood pressure because you haven't had a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. If there is bacteria that is documented, it needs to be treated and hopefully with the correct biofilm disruptor. And so let's talk a little bit about what biofilm disruptors get used for which types of biofilms and for which genetic conditions. Um, because this is the crux of how we're going to get people better, is knowing the best way that they can break down the biofilms that they have. Um, we mentioned earlier about extracellular DNA, where the bacteria themselves make their own um, biofilm. It turns out that there's a substance called bismuth. Um, most people have heard of Pepto-Bismol. It has bismuth in it. <laughs> um, bismuth is one of those transitional metals, uh, which means it isn't really quite a heavy metal. Um, but it does also mean that it isn't something that you take um, for months and months and months or years and years because you can potentially reach a toxic level. Um, there are a lot of excellent studies in the literature showing the efficacy of bismuth in breaking down extracellular DNA biofilms, particularly for a few select pathogens that we know about. Um, we know that some of the other ones do make extracellular DNA, but the research isn't there to substantiate which biofilm disruptors work best for those particular organisms. Um, the ones that the bismuth works on are H. pylori, which causes stomach ulcers. And that's why all the protocols out there for treating stomach ulcers have antibiotics plus bismuth. The bismuth doesn't kill bacteria, but it breaks down the biofilms so the antibiotics will work. The literature also is very extensive about how well bismuth works if you have Pseudomonas or Klebsiella. And those two particular infections are known to be difficult to get rid of. They're known to be um, ones that, that stay around a very long time and are, and are harder to treat. I think they're harder to treat because of their extracellular DNA. If you give a biofilm disruptor with bismuth, then the antibiotics will be more effective. And the one I recommend um, is from priority one. It is called biofilm phase two advanced. Although I know some compounding pharmacies make up um, capsules with bismuth. And so it's not the only way to get it. I'm not sure I'd take Pepto-Bismol, but, um, but I think that that is the biofilm disruptor that is needed if any lab report shows that you have Pseudomonas or Klebsiella. Now, the other part with the fibrin biofilms is where I've done the majority of, of my work. Um, I mentioned that 20% of the general population genetically has difficulty breaking down fibrin. That is because they carry one of three genetic variations or um, mutations that, that interfere with this fibrinolytic process. 
the one that I found most frequently is called um, PAI hyphen one, PI one, and that stands for plasminogen activator inhibitor. So when we talked about the fibrinolytic pathway being dependent upon converting plasminogen into plasmin, if you have this PI1 mutation, you don't convert plasminogen to plasmin very efficiently, like everybody else, okay? So if you have a PI1 mutation, you won't break down your fibrin well, and you will have more extensive biofilms, and it'll be harder to treat your infections. Now, interestingly, this PI1 mutation is considered so rare that hematologists don't even routinely check for it. I had hundreds of them. Um, <laughs> this, this one um, is, the, is the most important one. I found this twice as often as I did the, all the, the other two put together. Um, and I think that this is an important one because people with PI1 mutations have an increased incidence of miscarriages. They're more likely to have um, deep vein thrombosis, heart attacks, strokes. They have a family history of cardiovascular disease. And because this is a fibrin problem, you treat it with a fibrinolytic. Giving someone aspirin, which works on platelets and platelet stickiness, is not going to fix the too much fibrin problem. <laughs> yeah. So it's important to know if you have that particular genetic issue. Um, the second one that was I found most uh, next with the next degree of frequency was lipoprotein A. Lipoprotein A, or LP little a, some people call it, um, is a form of bad LDL cholesterol. Um, there's about 10 different genes that regulate lipoprotein A. So this technically is not a genetic test. It's simply a lab test where you get a number and either your lipoprotein A is high or it is not. <laughs> If it is high, um, that extra lipoprotein A binds to TPA, which we talked about earlier as needed, as necessary to convert plasminogen to plasmin. Um, so getting the lipoprotein A levels down is not always easy. These tend to be my most difficult patients to treat and the ones that take the longest. They need niacin, not the no flush niacinamide, but they need niacin to lower um, the lipoprotein A. It does not respond to diet or exercise or statin drugs. You can lower the total LDL with statin drugs, but it won't address that lipoprotein A part of it. Um, that can take months to bring that down. They also need a fibrinolytic to break down the fibrin that has built up as a result of not breaking down fibrin well. Um, the last one is called Leiden Factor 5, which most people have heard of. Um, it, it blocks activated protein C, but that's a finer detail than most people need because I only found about 18 or 20 of those out of hundreds and hundreds. So um, getting the testing done through LabCorp will tell you which one could be a contributor for you. Insurance pays for it. Um, it I think it's essential for this chronic population instead of guessing what the problem might be. Um, I should mention that the fibrinolytic that I used most often um, until I knew what the genetics were, Kirkman Biofilm Defense is a good start place to start. Um, I highly recommend doing that one for a week before doing the urine testing if, if what you're looking for is, is chronic UTIs or IC. Once you know the genetics, if there is a PI1, 
lipoprotein A or Leiden factor 5 issue, then lumbrokinase is the Cadillac of fibrinolytics. And um, we should talk a little bit about using that for um, long COVID, but we can move on on this if you want. <laughs> yes, I think everyone is really interested in that. You know, millions of people now have long COVID. How do biofilms contribute to long COVID and, and how would you think about um, addressing that? Although we know this is not a medical treatment podcast, but <laughs> de definitely just some ideas for people. I know there are a lot of people out there with long COVID or have loved ones that have long COVID. Um, from my pediatric background, I'm very aware of a condition called PANDAS, which is pediatric associated neuro mumbleness. I'm sure all the letters can stand for something that I should remember right now, and I don't. It's not a cute, but, it's not a cute, round, black and white animal. That's not what it is. Right. <laughs> That's not what it is. Okay. That eats um, bamboo. Yeah. Anyway, these children get a strep infection. They get strep yeah. throat. They may or may not have gotten the antibiotics for that. And then afterwards, they start developing psychiatric symptoms such as nervous tics, comp obsessive compulsive behavior, rage attacks, a whole spectrum of neurologic issues that surface. And what's puzzling about this is that the strep antibody titers and other markers that you can measure remain elevated, but you can't find the strep infection on um, a throat swab anymore. And so most of these children are put on long-term antibiotics that treat strep. And as long as they stay on those, they function much better. But oftentimes when they come off of the antibiotic, their OCD and their neurologic problems come right back with a vengeance. And I had the opportunity to, to treat some of these children, and every one of them had one of these biofilm problems genetically. And when I addressed that, we were able to get complete remission of the pandas. They were able to come off of their antibiotics and the strep titers with time came back down. So these infections were being walled off in the biofilm. And I think a similar process is what's going on in the long COVID patient because biofilms can not only wall off bacteria, but there was a great article published just this year, June 22nd, talking about how viruses can also wall off in biofilms. Now, I was suspicious of this, um, but I hadn't found the literature to document it. I was going to ask that question. I'm glad that came out in time for this podcast. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hot off the press. Exactly. <laughs> so, about a month ago, a number of articles showed up talking about long COVID patients having elevated levels of antiplasmin. <laughs> I just saw your eyes get big. <laughs> yeah. Poof. Poof, the light, light bulb, bulb went on. That's right. Illumination. In, these, in these long COVID patients, mm -hmm. six months and even a year later after having had COVID. Why would somebody have elevated levels of antiplasma? That's the question. The answer is, if your own fibrinolytic system has been pushing and pushing for month after month after month to break down the extra fibrin because the infection is still there, the body has an emergency breaking system on this conversion of plasminogen to plasmin it produces antiplasmin. Essentially an autoimmune attack because the body's kind of like, hey, wait a minute, there's too much plasma now. There is. We wow. have been fighting this battle too long, too hard. Like we don't body have... halts, ready to stop for a while, <laughs> take a little break, go to the beach for vacation. Right. Wow. That's so, that's so interesting. That's so interesting. So why, why does the virus persist? Is it because of the fibrin biofilm that protects it? Obviously there's yep. other reasons, but- yep. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Wow. 
Absolutely. I think that that's one of the body's defenses to try yeah. to wall it off in a biofilm, just like it tries to wall bacteria off in a biofilm. And then, of course, as you know, you know, our, our good friend Beth Shirley, right? There's like impaired nitric oxide. So that circulation isn't getting to the biofilm either, where, oh. which is carrying those immune cells. Exactly. But let me go back. So yeah. this explains to me why lumbrokinase, the Cadillac of fibrinolytics, is now being used in many long COVID protocols. Yeah. And why it's helping people with long COVID. What else do you recommend for, you know, other factors to consider besides biofilm treatment with these kind of chronic infections? Oh, I'm not the right person to discuss that mainly because I do bladders <laughs> <laughs> and biofilms and coagulation. Yeah but, yeah. but I think that this is an important piece of the puzzle. And I do agree that it would be good to have something on board, a good antiviral or something to meet, greet and kill the pathogens, whatever they are, coming out of the biofilm. A friendly assassin, basically. For yes. These viruses. <laughs> well, you know, these viruses too, we're always kind of taught, I think just while, as we listen to our bodies, and I think that's a really big take home for today's podcast is viruses or bacteria that are sitting there that we've been infected with, they don't always just go away, poof, magic, right? Like someone might have not as many symptoms, they feel good, they're back to work, they're back to playing and doing whatever they're doing, but they might be in there walled off by the biofilm that might cause problems later like long COVID, sure. essentially. And we know viruses do that. I mean, think about shingles. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it lies from, from chicken pox. It 30, lies 40 years. And then later it's like dormant and then, and then reactivates. Yeah. So we yeah. know that that's what happens, that the immune system tells these bad guys to go off and sit in the corner and not to come out and cause trouble. And then as you age, the immune system goes, pieces of the immune system go down. Um, you get a severe illness or infection and the immune system is off fighting that battle and these guys come out to play again. And the biofilms probably can only contain infections for a finite period of time or, or do they, you know, how, how do these organisms escape the biofilm? Ah, they don't escape as much as as they slowly multiply and the biofilm grows, pieces of the biofilm break off and go out to explore new and exciting places to establish an, a new attachment. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot here. Thank you so much, Ruth, for coming on. Um, I think this hopefully gives our listeners that are having some of these chronic issues, whether it's interstitial cystitis or long COVID. And, and I would just, I have to mention that because, you know, cardiovascular disease is still number one killer that, that, you know, really chronic infections can be a root cause. It sounds like it's a root cause of a lot of, right, chronic, chronic infections um, will cause fibrin biofilms, which then lead to cardiovascular clotting risk, right? So essentially that's going to be a root cause of cardiovascular disease as well. Yeah, let me, let me also add that if you have one of these genetic issues, not everybody right. gets dealt a perfect genetic hand. Um, Staying on a fibrinolytic the rest of your life is wise, not only from the standpoint of helping to make your treatment for the, inf the current infection um, move faster and eradicating that infection, but it also um, is important so that that fibrin doesn't build up and produce heart attacks and strokes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease in the future. And I think most all of this population has parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles who have had heart attacks or strokes or other cardiovascular, you know, clotting issues, mm -hmm. um, other cardiovascular diseases. And so you know that you are at higher risk, but having this information is power because now you can do something about it. It's not just a matter of crossing your fingers and saying a prayer that you're not gonna go down that same path. Um, I have a good friend from high school and um, 
she's she has been convinced for years that she's not going to live beyond a certain age because that's when her parents died and that's when her aunts and uncles died and that's just what happens in her family but i don't think you have to buy into that i think that you can get the testing needed to know if your um, chronic infections are due to a biofilm problem and then you address that based on the genetics with the proper uh, biofilm disruptors and then you stay on those for your long-term health you can't really change the cards you've been dealt but you can shift the odds in your favor it sounds like <laughs> so you know what's going on absolutely absolutely so, Ruth, thank you so much for coming on again. We have a fun closing question for you. Um, yes. You are an expert at integrative functional health. And if you were on a desert island, I'm not sure if the desert island has biofilms or not, but... <laughs> <laughs> My body does. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, there you go. That will help with this question then. What three supplements would you bring with you to oh. optimize your health? Well, of course, number one is lumbrokinase. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's going to break down the fibrin on an ongoing basis. So any infection I get is not going to become um, chronic and I can lower my cardiovascular disease risk. Um, I have a personal history of um, blood clots. I do have... Um, uh, parents, grandparents that have had heart attacks and strokes. So for me, that one would be number one. Um, the second one we didn't discuss, but it would be vitamin D. Um, 100% of my chronic UTI IC patients had a vitamin D receptor mutation. They made vitamin D as well as everybody else, but their bodies just don't hold on to it. It is a receptor issue. The bladder wall needs vitamin D to make um, cathelicidin, a peptide that prevents UTIs. So with my history, vitamin D would be right up there on the list. Um, I would like to think on a desert island that I um, could make enough vitamin D, but we know that in response to the sunlight, the skin darkens and it takes more and more sun exposure to make the same amount of vitamin D. There, there might be a lot of palm trees on that island. So there's, there's yeah, a lot of the shade. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and as you age, your skin does yeah. not make as much vitamin D. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I, I would want vitamin D. And the last one is a little bit more esoteric called NRF2. NRF2. It's made from broccoli. And the other thing that 100% of my patients had was a CBS cystothionine beta synthase mutation, which meant that um, you make too much ammonia and not enough cysteine to help you detox. The NERF-2 will help your body convert the cystothionine to cysteine so you can detox and, make le and you will make less ammonia. Um, the ammonia is important because when it builds up in the bladder, particularly at night, um, the very smart veterinarians, because cats get interstitial cystitis, um, have discovered that high levels of ammonia destroys the bladder lining or the gag layer. Got and it. that's a definition of interstitial cystitis in a nutshell. So mm -hmm. for me, lumbrokinase, vitamin D, and NERF2 would be the three supplements that I would take with me to the, des to the desert island <laughs> um, to help keep my body functioning as well as it can. Thank you. I do have to follow up with a question on the gag layer. So is there a way to build that up again? Oh, it will, it will, um, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> the mm -hmm. body turns over tissues in the body routinely it takes yeah. about four months for a bladder wall a damaged bladder wall to repair after you have gotten rid of the infection just like a cut on your arm if it's infected it won't heal until you address the infection yeah same thing happens with the bladder wall so the bladder wall will repair by itself now there have been some um Studies done with um, chondroitin and hyaluronic acid as it bladder installations to accelerate that process. Uh, that has been marketed in Europe for some time, and um, the FDA refused to let it be marketed in the United States. 
Um, for a while, I had a compounding pharmacy making it up, but once the FDA gave it a thumbs down, they were no longer legally allowed to mm. do that. Oh, wow. Unfortunate. Well, thank you so much, Ruth, for coming on today. You're such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for your generosity and sharing that with our listeners. And hopefully it's been helpful for a lot of people. I know it has. But uh, how can listeners learn more about you and your work in educating the population with uh, kind of how to deal with these these things? Um, I have closed my medical practice at this point, but I have reinvented. That's different than retiring. That's right. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a consultant for practitioners, um, listeners can go to ruthchris.com. There's a scheduling link that the practitioners can use to schedule time with me using my scheduling link. Um, they can go to liveutifree.com and learn more about my approach. There's also on Live UTI Free a list of practitioners, including Capital Integrative Health, oh, thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> with whom I consult, and I help practitioners interpret the results of the lab tests and I make treatment recommendations. Um, I can also help uh, with advising your practitioner which biofilm disruptors would be the most effective for you and um, work with them to help you overcome chronic infections. I love that website, you liveutifree.com. Who wouldn't want that? But um, again, Ruth, um, great that you're uh, right here, close in a fairly neighboring state, North Carolina. Um, hopefully the weather's good down there and um, good luck with that. And we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for educating us here at CIH and all of our listeners. Well, thank you so much for um, having me on. And um, I've really enjoyed being able to share with you and your listeners the things that I've learned. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to leave us a review. It helps our podcast to reach more listeners. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our next episodes and conversations. And thank you so much again for being with us.